Chapter twenty seven of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, part two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, part two. By Francois Rene de Chateaubriand. Chapter twenty seven. London from April till September, eighteen twenty two. Cataract of Niagara. Rattlesnake. I fall at the edge of the abyss. I remained two days in the Indian village, whence I wrote a letter to M. de Malzerbe. The Indian women were occupied in different ways at work. Their infants were suspended in wicker baskets from the branches of a large purple beech. The grass was covered with dew, the wind came laden with perfume from the forests, and the cotton plants with their hanging pods resemble white rose trees. The breeze rocked the airy cradles with almost imperceptible motion. The mothers rose occasionally to see whether their children still slept, or whether they had been awakened by the birds. From the Indian village to the cataract was reckoned a distance of between three and four leagues. It took myself and my guide as many hours to reach it. When we approached within six miles of it, I could see a column of vapour indicating the spot of the fall. My heart beat with a joy mingled with terror as I entered the wood which concealed from my eyes one of the grandest sights ever offered by nature to man. We alighted, and leading our horses by the bridle, passed through bushes and thicket, and reached the bank of the river Niagara, seven or eight hundred feet above the fall. I continued to move forward, and the guide seized me by the arm and stopped me at the very edge of the water, which flowed by with the rapidity of an arrow. It did not foam, but glided in one smooth mass to the very edge of the precipice. Its silence before its fall formed a striking contrast with the noise of the fall itself. Scripture often compares a nation to great waters. The Niagara above the fall is the emblem of a dying nation, deprived of all power of voice by its agony, hurrying on to the abyss of eternity. The guide continued to hold me back, for I felt myself drawn, as it were, towards the river, and urged by an involuntary impulse to throw myself into it. I looked now up along the shore, now down towards the island, which rose suddenly amidst the vast plain of waters, dividing them as if they had been cleft in the sky. After standing for about a quarter of an hour in a confused reverie of undefined admiration, I proceeded to the fall. My ideas and impressions of it will be found in the Essay sur les Révolutions and in Atala. Now there are good roads leading to the cataract, inns on the American and English shores, mills and manufactories below the chasm. At the time I saw it, none of these were in existence. I had no utterance for the thoughts which agitated me at the sight of such sublime confusion. In the desolate solitude of my early life, I was forced to invent personages to embellish it. I drew from the sources of my own mind, ideal beings whom I found nowhere else, creatures of my own imagination. Thus with the cataract of Niagara I have associated recollections of Atala and René, like the expression of its solemnity and sadness. What is a cascade eternally falling over its precipice in the silent, unimpressible presence of earth and sky, if human nature is not there with its destinies and its unhappiness? How joyless to plunge into this solitude of water and mountain, and to have no one to whom to pour out the feelings inspired by the magnificent spectacle, to have the waves, the rocks, the woods and torrents for oneself alone, give a companion to the soul and the smiling verdure of the hills, the fresh breath of the wave thrill it with delight, the daily journey, the sweet repose at its close, the gentle rocking on the waves, the soft sleep on the moss, draw forth its fullest depths of tenderness. My fancy plays for later on the Amorican strand, Simodice, beneath the porticos of Athens, Blanca and the halls of the Alhambra. Alexander left cities as monuments in his track. I left dreams as the only trace of my footsteps. I have seen the Alpine cascades with the Achamois, the Pyrenees with the Osiris. I did not go as far up the hill as its cataracts, which are now known to be only rapids. I do not speak of the variegated columns of Terni and Tivoli, elegant lines of ruins, or subjects for the poet's song at Precepts Anio act Tiberni Lucas, the rapid Anio, and the sacred grove of Tybal. Niagara faces them all. I was contemplating the cataract revealed to the old world, not by insignificant travellers like myself, but by missionaries who, seeking God in these solitudes, threw themselves on their knees at the sight of some wonder of nature, and received martyrdom while chanting their hymn of admiration. Our priests greeted the natural wonders of America, and consecrated them with their blood, our soldiers have applauded at the ruins of Thebes, and presented arms in Andalusia. The whole genius of France lies in the double militia of her camps and her altars. I had my bridle twisted round my arm. A rattlesnake moved in the thicket, and my horse, startled at the noise, 
reared and backed towards the fall i could not free my arm and the horse becoming more and more unmanageable dragged me after him his fore feet were already over the edge hanging on the very verge of the abyss he kept himself from falling solely by the muscular strength of his back i gave myself up for lost when suddenly the animal astonished at his new danger made a great effort and regained his footing by a quick turn had i lost my life amidst the canadian woods would my soul have carried with it to the supreme tribunal the sacrifices the good works and virtues of the fathers jogues and lallemande or a burden of useless days and miserable chimeras this was not the only danger which i incurred at niagara a ladder of bind reed enabled the natives to descend into the lower basin but this was now broken wishing to see the cataract from below i ventured notwithstanding the representations of my guide to descend the side of an almost conical rock the water roared and boiled below me but my head remained steady and i succeeded in descending about forty feet but here the bare perpendicular rock offered nothing to which i could cling i remained hanging by one hand to the last tree root feeling my fingers relax their grasp with the weight of my body few men have in the course of their lives passed two minutes such as those i now passed at length my hand lost its hold and i fell by extraordinary good fortune i found myself on the ledge of a rock on which i was much more likely to have been dashed to pieces i did not feel much hurt i was within half a foot of the chasm and yet had not fallen into it but when the cold and damp began to chill me i found that i had not escaped so easily as i imagined my left arm was broken above the elbow my guide who was watching me from above and to whom i made signals of distress hastened in search of some indians they pulled me up with ropes by an otter path and carried me to their village it was merely a simple fracture and two splints a bandage and a sling sufficed for my cure End of chapter twenty seven chapter twenty eight of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter twenty eight london from april till september eighteen twenty two twelve days in a hut change of manners among the indians birth and death montagne song of the snake singing of a little indian girl the original of mila i remained for twelve days under the care of my doctors the indians of niagara and while there saw some other tribes on their way down from detroit and the districts to the south and east of lake erie i made inquiries respecting their customs and by means of small presents obtained representations and details of their ancient manners now no longer in existence yet at the commencement of the war of american independence the indians still ate the prisoners or rather those who were killed an english captain taking soup from an indian pot with a large spoon drew up a hand the events of birth and death among the indians have retained more of their ancient associations and customs than any other because these events are not changed by outward influences like the life which lies between them they are not matters of fashion passing with its breath the oldest name beneath an indian roof is still conferred on an infant as an honour that of its grandmother for example for names always descend in the maternal line from that moment the child occupies the place of the woman whose name has been given to it and in speaking to it it is addressed by the degree of parentage revived by its name thus an uncle may salute his nephew by the title of grandmother this custom ridiculous in appearance is nevertheless touching it brings those who are gone to life again it reproduces the weakness of age in that of infancy it connects the extremes of life the beginning and the end of a family it communicates a kind of immortality to the ancestors and supposes them present amidst their posterity as regards the dead it is easy to find motives for the attachment of the savage to sacred remains civilized nations have the ever-living spirit of literature and art to preserve the recollections of their country they have cities palaces towers columns and obelisks they have the trace of the plough in the fields already cultivated names are carved in brass and marble actions immortalized in chronicles the nations of these solitudes have nothing of all this their names are not inscribed on the trees their huts built in a few hours disappear in a few moments their labour but grazes the earth and does not even make a furrow their traditional songs perish with the last memory which retains them with the last voice that repeats them the tribes of the new world have then but one monument the tomb 
take from the savage the bones of his fathers and you take his history his laws and his gods you take from the race in future generations the proofs of their existence as of their non-existence i wish to hear my host sing a pretty little indian girl named mila of about fourteen years old the indian women are only pretty when very young sang very pleasingly was this not the couplet cited by montaigne stay snake stay snake and let my sister take the pattern of thy colours to work a rich cord that i may give to my love and thy beauty and disposition shall always be preferred to that of all other snakes End of chapter 28chapter twenty nine of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter twenty nine london from april to september eighteen twenty two reflections old canada indian population demoralization true civilization promoted by religion false civilization by trade backwoodsmen factories hunting mixed races contest between trading companies death of the indian languages the canadians are no longer such as they have been described by cartier champlain laontin lescarbot lafito charvois and the lettre edifiante the sixteenth century and the beginning of the seventeenth were the times of fertile imagination and of simple manners the admiration of the former reflected a virgin nature and the candour of the latter reproduced the simplicity of the savage champlain at the end of his first voyage to canada in sixteen o three relates that an island lying to the south of the bay of chaleur is regarded as the abode of a dreadful monster whom the savages call gougou canada had its giant as well as the cape of storms homer is the true father of all these fables there are always and everywhere cyclops scylla and charybdis ogres or giants the savage population of north america exclusive of mexico and the esquimaux does not at present amount to four hundred thousand souls reckoning all the tribes on both sides of the rocky mountains some travellers limit the number to a hundred and fifty thousand demoralization has kept pace among the indians with the diminution of their tribes religious traditions are become confused the instruction imparted by the jesuits in canada has become mixed up with ideas foreign to the native ideas of the indigenous races through the mists of gross fables they may still be traced some distorted images of christian truths the most of the indians wear crosses in the manner of ornaments and what the catholic missionaries formerly bestowed as emblems of religious faith are sold to them now by protestant traders let me observe to the honour of our country and the glory of our religion that the indians were warmly attached to us that they never ceased to regret our rule and that a black gown a missionary is still held in veneration amid the forests of america the savage continues to love us under the tree where we were his first guests on the soil which we have trodden and where we have committed to him the care of our tombs as long as the indian continued naked or clothed in skins there was something great and noble in his character now european rags without covering his nakedness bear witness to his misery he is like a beggar at the door of a counting-house and no longer a savage in his wilds lastly there has sprung up a kind of half-caste race the offspring of colonists and indian women these men surnamed burntwoods bois brule, on account of the colour of their skin are the great promoters of change between the authors of their double origin speaking at once the language of both parents they inherit the vices of both races these meagre descendants of a civilized and a savage nature sell themselves one while to the americans and another to the english in order to secure for the one or the other monopoly of the fur trade they cherish rivalries between the english hudson's bay and northwest companies with those of the columbian american and missouri fur companies and others they themselves are continually engaged in hunting expeditions for contractors and accompanied by hunters paid out of the funds of the several companies the great war of american independence is alone known the world is ignorant of the fact that blood has been shed to promote the miserable interests of a mere handful of traders in eighteen eleven the hudson's bay company sold to lord selkirk a territory on the banks of the red river where an establishment was formed in eighteen twelve the north-west or canada company took offence at the proceeding 
the two factions and their respective indian allies seconded by the bois brule came to actual hostilities and this domestic conflict horrible in its details took place in the midst of the icy deserts of hudson's bay lord selkirk's colony was destroyed in the month of june eighteen fifteen precisely at the period of the battle of waterloo on these two theatres so different in their renown and obscurity the calamities of the human race were the same we must seek no longer in america for those skilfully constructed political constitutions of which charvois has given an account for the monarchy of the hurons and the republic of the iroquois changes of the same nature have been brought about and are still gradually occurring in europe even under our eyes a prussian poet at a banquet of the teutonic order about the year fourteen hundred sang in the ancient prussian language of the heroic deeds of the ancient warriors of his country no one understood him and his only reward was one hundred empty nuts in the present day the barbreton the basque and the gaelic are perishing from hut to hut as the generations of shepherds and labourers pass away in the english county of cornwall the original language became obsolete about the year sixteen seventy six a fisherman there said to some travellers i hardly know more than four or five persons who speak cornish and they are old people like myself from sixty to eighty years of age none of the young people understand a word of it some tribes that formerly lived on the orinoco exist no longer there only remain about a dozen words of their dialect which are uttered from the tops of the trees by paroquets which have regained their liberty like agrippinus thrush which chattered greek upon the balustrades of the palace at rome such will be sooner or later the fate of our modern jargons which are made up of the remnants of greek and latin some magpie escaped from the cage of the last french priest will be heard to call out from the top of the belfry of a ruin to the unknown people who may succeed us except this the last effort of a language once known you will put an end to all further conversation in it be then a bossuet and the consequence will be that your chef d'oeuvre may survive in the recollection of a bird your language and your memory in the minds of men end of chapter twenty nine Chapter thirty of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, part two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, part two, by Francois Rene de Chateaubriand. Chapter thirty. London from April till September, eighteen twenty two. The former possessions of France in America regrets past follies note from francis cunningham speaking of canada and louisiana and inspecting the old map of the original french settlements in america i am at a loss to understand how the government of my country allowed these colonies which would have been now an inexhaustible source of prosperity to us to pass out of their hands from acadia and canada to louisiana from the mouth of the st lawrence to that of the mississippi the territory of new france encompassed that which formed the confederacy of the first thirteen united states the other eleven with the district of columbia the territories of michigan the northwest the missouri oregon and arkansas belonged to us or would have come into our possession as they now belong to the united states by the cession of the english and the spaniards who succeeded us in canada and louisiana the whole territory lying between the atlantic on the northeast the polar sea on the north the pacific with the russian possessions in the northwest and the mexican gulf on the south that is to say more than two-thirds of the whole of north america acknowledge the laws of france i fear lest the restoration may prove vain in consequence of the adoption of views contrary to those which i have here expressed the madness of adhering to precedents a folly which i never cease to combat would not be by any means so sad had it only disturbed me by depriving me of the favour of my prince but it may perhaps cause the overthrow of the throne to be stationary in political affairs is impossible it is necessary to advance with the progress of human intelligence let us respect the dignity given by time let us look back with veneration to the past ages which are rendered sacred by the memory and the relics of our ancestors at the same time let us not attempt to retrograde towards them for they have no longer anything real in common with us and should we attempt to seize them they would vanish the chapter of notre dame at aix la chapelle had the tomb of charlemagne opened as it is said about the year fourteen fifty they found the emperor seated in a gilt chair holding in his skeleton hands the books of the evangelists written in letters of gold 
Before him were placed his sceptre and his shield of gold. By his side lay his joyeuse, sheathed in a golden scabbard. He was clothed in imperial robes. Upon his head, which was retained in its proper position by a chain of gold, was a piece of linen, which covered what had once been his face, and which was surmounted by a crown. They touched the phantom, and it crumbled into dust. We possessed beyond sea an immense tract of country. It afforded a refuge for the excess of our population, a field for our commerce, and a supply of sailors for our navy. We are excluded from the new world, where the human race is taking a fresh start. The English, Portuguese, and Spanish languages serve in Africa, in Asia, in Polynesia, in the islands of the South Seas, and on the continent of the two Americas, as a vehicle for expressing the thoughts of many millions of human beings, whilst we, deprived of the acquisitions made by our courage and our skill, only hear the language of Colbert and of Louis the Fourteenth, spoken under the government of foreign nations in some small districts of Canada and Louisiana. It only remains as a witness of the reverses of our fortune and the faults of our administration. And who is the monarch whose rule now replaces that of the French king over the Canadian forests? The same who caused this note to be written to me yesterday. Royal Lodge, Windsor, June 4, 1822. My Lord Viscount, I am commanded by His Majesty to invite Your Excellency to dine and sleep at the palace on Thursday, the sixth instant, your very humble and obedient servant, Francis Cunningham. It was a part of my fate to be tormented by princes. But I pause. I recross the Atlantic. I have the arm reset which was broken at Niagara. I lay aside my bearskin dress and resume my embroidered apparel. I go from the wigwam of an Iroquois to the royal lodge of His Britannic Majesty, the monarch of the three United Kingdoms and lord of the Indies. I leave my host with the pierced ears and the little savage girl adorned with pearls, wishing my lady Cunningham the gentleness of Mila together with that age which belongs only to the young spring, those days which precede the month of May, and which our French poets call La Vrie. End of chapter 30chapter thirty one of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter thirty one london from april till september eighteen twenty two revised in december eighteen forty six the account originally written in America, the lakes of Canada, flotilla of Indian canoes, ruins of nature, valley of the tomb, destiny of rivers. The tribe of the young girl with the pearl set out. My guide, the Dutchman, refused to accompany me beyond the cataract. I paid him and joined some traders who were setting out to descend the Ohio. Before starting, I cast a glance upon the Canadian lakes. There is nothing so sad as the aspect of these lakes. The plains of the ocean and of the Mediterranean afford highways for nations, and their shores are, or were, inhabited by races numerous, powerful, and civilized. The Canadian lakes present nothing but open waters surrounded by desert land, solitudes which divide other solitudes, shores without inhabitants overlook waters without ships. You land from desert waves upon a desert strand. Lake Erie is more than one hundred leagues in circumference. The nations which dwelt upon its banks were exterminated by the Iroquois two centuries ago. It is fearful to see the Indians venturing their bark canoes upon this lake so celebrated for tempests, and which was formerly the habitation of thousands of snakes. These Indians hang up their garments at the head of their canoes, and launch into the midst of the eddies caused by the turbulent waves. The waves, on a level with the gunwale of the canoes, appear ready to swallow them up. The hunter's dogs, with their paws upon the gunwale, utter short barks, while their masters, preserving a profound silence, strike the waters with their paddles in regular time. The canoes advance in single file. At the prow of the foremost, the chief stands upright, and repeats the diphthong, o -a, o -a, with a full and prolonged intonation, a with a short and quick tone. In the highmost canoe is another chief, also standing, who manages a branch in the form of a rudder. The other warriors squat on their heels at the bottom of the canoes. Through the fog and the spray are only to be seen the feathers with which the heads of the Indians are adorned, the outstretched necks of the howling dogs, and the shoulders of the two sachems, the pilot and the steersman, 
as one might say the gods of the lakes the rivers of canada are without annals in the old world how different is the fate of the ganges the euphrates the nile the danube and the rhine how much sweat and blood have conquerors poured forth in order to cross in their course those waters which a goat herd can step across at their source End of chapter thirty one Chapter thirty two of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, part two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, part two, by Francois Rene de Chateaubriand. Chapter thirty two. London from April till September, eighteen twenty two. The course of the Ohio leaving the lakes of canada we came to port william at the confluence of the rivers ohio and kentucky there the landscape displays a most extraordinary magnificence this splendid country is however called kentucky from the name of the river which flows through it and which signifies the river of blood it owes its name to its beauty during the space of two centuries the tribes in alliance with the cherokees disputed its occupation with those of the iroquois will the european races which now people the banks prove more virtuous and free than the exterminated savages is there not slave labour in this country of man's primitive independence under the lash of their masters do no prisons and gibbets replace the open hut and the tall tulip tree in which the birds built their nests will the riches of nature give rise to no new wars will kentucky cease to be the land of blood and will the monuments of art prove a greater ornament to the banks of the ohio than the monuments of nature after passing the wabash the great cypress the cumberland river the cherokee or tennessee and the yellow banks we arrive at a strip of land often flooded when the waters are high here the confluence of the mississippi and the ohio takes place in latitude thirty six degrees fifty four minutes north the two rivers offering equal resistance slacken their speed they run alongside of each other in the same channel without mingling for some miles as two great races originally separate but subsequently amalgamated form only one nation as two illustrious rivals share the same couch after the battle as man and wife descended from hostile races who had at first little inclination towards one another subsequently joined their destinies in marriage for myself like the powerful sources of rivers i have spread out the little course of my life at one time on one side of a mountain and then again on the other wilful in my mistakes yet never intentionally doing wrong preferring poor valleys to rich plains, resting on flowers rather than in a palace. As for the rest, I was so much pleased with my travels that I thought little about the pole. A company of traders about to start for the country of the creeks in the Floridas permitted me to join them. We set forward towards the country then known under the general name of the Floridas, but now divided into the states of Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, and Tennessee. We followed pretty nearly the footpath which now connects the great road from Natchez to Nashville with Jackson and Florence, and which enters Virginia by Knoxville and Salem, a country at this time very little frequented, but the lakes and best portions of which Bertram had nevertheless explored. The planters of Georgia and the coasts of the Floridas came to the residences of the different tribes of creeks to buy horses and half-wild beasts, which multiplied amazingly on the savannas that surrounded the springs on the banks of which I have represented Atala and Chactas as reposing. They even extended their journeys as far as the Ohio. We were urged on in our course by a fresh wind. The Ohio, swelled by the tribute of a hundred rivers, was at one time lost in the lakes which opened before us, and at another in the forests. Islands arose in the middle of the lakes. We made sail towards one of the largest and landed at eight o'clock in the morning. I crossed a prairie strewn over with the yellow-flowered ragwort, the variegated mallow, roses, and the purple-tufted obelaria. An Indian river attracted my attention. The contrast between this ruin and the apparent newness of nature, this monument of mankind in a desert, made a great impression upon me. What race dwelt on this island? What was their name, what their origin, and what the period of their extinction? Did they live while the world in whose bosom they were hidden continued unknown to the other three parts of the globe? Their silence was possibly cotemporary, with the fame of other great nations, which have since in their turn passed away into oblivion. On the sandy nooks, among the ruins of the tumuli, there grows a species of poppy, with red flowers, 
hanging at the end of small footstalks from a green stem the stalk and the flower have a smell which is communicated to the fingers on touching the plant this smell which survives the flower is but an emblem of the memory of a life spent in solitude i watched the water-lilies as they began to hide their white flowers under the waves towards the close of day and the periatica which only encloses its flowers at night the pyramidal enothera with oblong denticulated leaves of a dark green colour has other habits and another destiny its yellow flower begins gradually to expand in the evening when venus is sinking below the horizon it continues to open to the rays of the stars the dawn finds it in all its beauty during the forenoon it fades and at midday falls off it only lives a few hours but it spends these hours under a serene sky fanned by the breath of venus and aurora what matters then the shortness of its life garlands of dionea hang over the streams and insects hum around there are also hummingbirds and butterflies whose brilliant colours vie in splendour with the variegated tints of the flowers during these excursions and in the midst of such studies i was often struck with their vanity what could not the revolution which had driven me into the woods and still hung over me inspire me with some more serious thoughts was it during the period of the distractions of my country that i should be engaged in describing plants butterflies and flowers the selfishness of mankind affords a standard for estimating the slight importance of the most astonishing events how many men are totally indifferent to all such occurrences how many more entirely ignorant of them the total population of the globe is estimated at from one billion one hundred million to one billion two hundred million one individual dies every second and thus during every minute we pass in grief or joy the sixty human beings expire and sixty families are plunged into mourning and sorrow life is but one continued torment the chain of mourning and funerals by which we are encircled never breaks but constantly enlarges its circuit we ourselves form a link in the chain let us still however exalt and magnify the importance of those catastrophes of which seven-eighths of the world never hear still let us pant after a renown which will never extend a few leagues from our tombstones let us plunge into the ocean of bliss of which each instant glides away among sixty coffins constantly renewed nam nox nulla diem neque noctem auroris cuta est que non audierit mixtos vagitibus egris ploratus mortis committis et funeris atri no day has passed nor night succeeded morn but still the sounds of mourning and of grief have sounded loud attendance upon death End of chapter thirty two Chapter thirty three of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, part two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, part two, by Francois Rene de Chateaubriand. Chapter thirty three. London from April till September, eighteen twenty two. Fountain of Jouvence, Muscogees and Seminoles, our camp the natives of florida have a legend that in the middle of one of their lakes lies an island inhabited solely by beautiful women the muskogees they say have often attempted its conquest but this eden vanishes before their canoes an image of the chimeras which flee before the grasp of our desires this island also contained a fountain of jouance who desires to renew his life by a draught these fables were very near assuming a kind of reality in my eyes at a moment when we least expected it we saw a flotilla of canoes leave a bay some rowed others with sails and make for our island which they soon reached the canoes contained two families of creek indians the one seminoles the other muskogees among the latter were a number of cherokees and bois brule i was struck with the elegance of these savages who bore no resemblance to those of canada the seminoles and muskogees are rather large fine-looking men but by an extraordinary contrast their mothers wives and daughters are the smallest race of women known in america the indian women who landed on our island belonged to a race of mingled cherokee and spanish blood and were tall two of them resembled the creoles of san domingo and the isle of france but had the delicate olive complexion of the women of the ganges these two floridans cousins on the father's side served as my models the one of atala the other of saluta but they excelled the sketches i have made of them in that variable and fugitive truth of nature those characteristics of race and climate which i have been unable thoroughly to depict there was an indescribable charm in the oval countenance the complexion 
over which a shade as of a light orange coloured mist seemed cast the black soft hair the long eyes half concealed beneath their satin lids languidly lifted to allow a glimpse of them in short in the united seductions of the indian and the spaniard this meeting with our host caused some little change in our plans our trading agents began to inquire about horses and it was decided that we should go and encamp near the place where the horses were kept the plain on which our camp was established was covered with cattle horses bisons buffaloes cranes turkeys and pelicans these birds variegated the green pasture land with their white black and rose-coloured plumage the love affairs of the spaniards and the creek women formed the groundwork of many adventures and in these romances the bois brule played a principal part one story put into seminole verse under the name of tabamica was chanted in crossing the woods carried off in their turn by the colonists the indian women soon died neglected at pensacola and the tale of their misfortunes went to enlarge the romanceros and to be placed beside the lamentations of himena the two floridans ruins on the ohio the earth is a charming mother we owe existence to her in infancy she feeds us with milk and honey in youth and maturity she lavishes her cooling springs her harvests and fruits on us she offers us everywhere shade bath table and bed and when we die she receives us again to her bosom and clothes our remains in grass and flowers while she secretly transforms us into her own substance to reproduce us in some graceful form such were my thoughts when my opening eyes rested on the blue heaven the canopy of my couch the hunters were gone on their daily occupation and i remained alone with the women and the children i left not the side of my two sylvan goddesses the one was haughty the other sad i did not understand a word they said to me nor they one that i said to them but i fetched water for their bowl branches for their fire and moss for their bed they wore the spanish short petticoat and slashed sleeves the indian bodice and cloak their bare legs were wreathed with a kind of lace or fringe made from part of the birch tree they entwined their hair with bouquets or reeds and covered themselves with chains and collars of coloured glass from their ears hung purple seeds they had a pretty speaking parroquet bird of armida they fastened it to their shoulders after the manner of an emerald or carried it hooded on their hands as the great ladies of the tenth century used to carry the hawk to strengthen their breast and arms they rubbed themselves with the apaya or american cypress in bengal the bayadere chew the beetle and in the levant the almes suck the cheomastic the floridans crush between their transparent teeth the gum of the liquid umbar and the root of the libanis which exhaled the mingled fragrance of angelica cedra and vanilla they lived in an atmosphere of perfumes emanating from themselves like orange trees and flowers in the pure effluence of their leaves and chalices i amused myself by adorning their heads with some wreath or ornament of my own invention they submitted in a sort of gentle alarm enchantresses themselves they imagined that i was performing some charm on them one of them the haughty one frequently prayed she appeared to me to be half a christian the other sang in a voice soft as velvet uttering every now and then a cry which thrilled the ear sometimes they spoke together with great animation i fancied i detected the accents of jealousy but the sad one wept and silence returned weak myself i sought examples of weakness as precedents had not Camerons loved a black slave of barbary in the indies and might not i offer homage in america to two orange-coloured sultanas had not Camerons addressed endechas or stanzas to barbara escrava had he not said to her aquella captiva que me tem captivo porque nella vivo ja nau quem que viva en nunque virosa em suaves molos que para meus olhos fosse mais formosa preti dao de amor tau doce a figura que a neve he jura que trocara a cor leda mansidao que osiso a compania rem pareve estranha mas barbara now this captive who holds me captive because i live in her does not spare my life never was rose in a sweet nosegay so charming to my eyes her black hair inspires love her face is so sweet that the snow desires to change colour with her her gaiety is accompanied by reserve she is a stranger not a barbarian we made a fishing party the sun was near its setting the wood formed as it were three ranges the first composed of sassafras tulip trees catalpas and oaks whose branches were clothed with white moss behind this first range rose the most beautiful of trees the papaya looking like a column of chased silver surmounted by a corinthian urn 
and highest of all waved the takamahaka the magnolia and the liquid umber the sun now sank behind this ridge of foliage a ray glancing beneath the tree-tops glittered like a set carbuncle on the dark leaves then diverging among the trunks and branches through widening streaks and changing arabesques on the turf at the feet of the trees were lilac bushes azaleas masses of bindweed with its flexible twisting branches overhead clouds in every variety of form some stationary like promontories or old towers others floating along like rosy mists or carded silk their successive transformations gave to view now as it were a fiery cavern mouth now a pile of burning coal now a river of lava the whole was resplendent radiant and golden bathed in the rich light after the insurrection in the morea in 1770 many greek families took refuge in florida they might still imagine themselves in the climate of ionia which would seem to have become soft and voluptuous in proportion as men's passions gain the ascendancy at smyrna in the evening nature sleeps like one exhausted with excess of delight to our right were some ruins belonging to the great fortifications discovered on the ohio to our left an ancient camp of the indians the island on which we were caught in the reflection of the wave and reproduced by mirage spread its double perspective before our eyes to the east the moon seemed to rest on the distant hills to the west the azure vault of heaven seemed to melt away into a sea of diamond and sapphire in which the sun half sunk appeared to dissolve all the animals of creation were awake and full of life the earth in adoration seemed to offer incense to the sky and the perfumes exhaled from it returned upon it in a refreshing dew as a prayer returns on the head of him who prays i quitted my companions and sat down near a thick clump of trees their shadow here and there shot with rays of light cast its protecting coolness over me fireflies glittered among the shrubs and were eclipsed when they issued into the moonbeams the gentle murmuring flow of the lake fell on the air with an occasional splash of a goldfish or cry of a wild duck my eyes were fixed on the water and i fell by degrees into the state of somnolency well known to men who travel much no distinct recollection remained in my mind i felt myself living and vegetating with nature in a kind of pantheism i leaned against the trunk of a magnolia and fell asleep my slumber was cradled as it were on a vague sea of hope on awaking i found the two indians beside me they had found me asleep and not wishing to awaken me had sat down silently one on each side and whether it was that they were really asleep or feigning to be so their heads had fallen on my shoulders a breeze passed through the thicket and covered us with a shower of magnolia blossoms the youngest of the seminoles began to sing let no one who is not quite secure of his own firmness ever expose himself thus to danger passion instilled through the voice of melody increases tenfold in power suddenly a rude jealous voice replied to these sweet accents a bois brule called the two cousins they trembled and rose the dawn was beginning to appear in the east i looked on a similar scene to this on the shores of greece though without an aspasia i ascended the parthenon with the dawn and saw cythera mount hymetus the acropolis of corinth the tombs and the ruins bathed in a transparent golden mist of light reflected by the sea and floating like a perfume on the zephyrs of salamis and delos we performed our short voyage in silence at midday the camp was broken up to go and examine the horses which the cricks wished to sell and the traders to buy women and children all were called together as witnesses as is their custom on great occasions of dealing horses of all ages and colours colts and mares bulls cows and heifers began to gallop about us in the confusion i was separated from the cricks a large group of horses and men was collected on the skirts of a wood and suddenly i caught sight of my two floridans among them they were being lifted on two horses and behind them mounted without a saddle a bois brule and a seminole o oh, cid why had i not thy fleet steed babicha to hasten after them they rode off and the immense squadron followed the horses kicked bounded and neighed among the buffaloes and other cattle their feet met in the air their tails and manes were bloody a cloud of devouring insects enveloped this wild cavalcade and my two floridans vanished like the daughter of ceres carried off by pluto thus it is that everything in my life's history vanishes without trace or aim i only retain dreams of all that has passed so swiftly i shall descend to the elysian fields accompanied by more shadows than ever man took with him before the fault lies in my organization i know not how to profit by any good fortune i am interested in nothing that interests other men except in religion i have no belief had my destiny made me a pastor or a king 
what should i have done with my crozier or my sceptre i should have become equally weary of fame and genius of labour and ease of prosperity and adversity everything wearies me i am troubled to perceive how my days are weighed down with ennui and i go about yawning away my life End of chapter 33chapter thirty four of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter thirty four the two indians arrest of louis the sixteenth at varennes i determined to return to europe Ronsard has given us a description of Mary Stuart on her departure for Scotland, after the death of Francis the Second. De tel abbey vous étiez accoustré, partant et là, de la belle contrée, dont avait le sceptre dans la main, lorsque pensive et baignant votre scène, du beau cristal de vos larmes roulées, triste, marché par les longues allées du grand jardin de ce royal château, qui prend son nom de la source d'une eau. Did I bear any resemblance to Mary Stuart, wandering at Fontainebleau, when I wandered over my meadows after losing my fair companions? It is certain, at all events, that my mind, if not my person, was enveloped in a crepe long, sutile et délié, as Ronsard, an old poet of the new school, goes on to say of her. My evil genius having carried off my two Floridans, I learned from my guide that a bois brûlé, who was in love with one of the women and had become jealous of me, had determined with the aid of a Seminole, the brother of the other, to take Atala and Saluta out of my reach. The guides unscrupulously designated them by no very respectful name, which wounded my vanity. I was the more humiliated as the Bois Brule, my successful rival, was a lean, black, ugly rascal, possessing all the characteristics of those insects which, according to the definition of the entomologists of the Grand Lama, are animals having their flesh inside and their bones outside. The solitudes appeared empty to me after my mishap, i gave an uncourteous reception to myself who generously hastened to console a faithless lover like julie when she pardoned saint preux his floridans of paris i was in haste to quit the wilds and have since described my companions of that night i know not whether i have given back to them in full the life they gave me but i have at least in expiation made one of them a blameless maiden and the other a chaste wife we recrossed the blue mountains and again approached the european clearings in the neighbourhood of chillicothe I had gained no information on the principal object of my journey, but I was surrounded and escorted by a world of poetry, from une jeune abbaye aux roses engagées, ma muse revenait de son butin chargé. I came upon an American house on the banks of a stream, a farm in one wing, a mill in the other. I went in to seek a lodging and was well received. My hostess led me up a ladder to a room over the mill wheel. My little window, festooned with ivy and water iris, looked on the mill stream running straight and solitary between two close lines of willows alders sassafras tamarinds and carolina poplars the mossy wheels slowly turned beneath their shade throwing long streams of water from it with every turn perch and trout leapt in the foam of the eddy wagtails flew from one bank to the other and a sort of kingfisher hovered with their blue wings over the stream would it not have been delightful to have had my melancholy floridan beside me supposing her faithful to have sat dreaming at her feet with my head on her knee listening to the noise of the cascade, the revolutions of the wheel, the confused noise of the mill-works, the sifting and bolting of the flour, the regular strokes of the mill-clapper, breathing the freshness of the water and the pleasant odour of the pearly grain. Night came, and I went down to the common room. It was only lighted by the flame of the bundles of maize straw and bean-shells, which were blazing on the hearth. Some guns belonging to the master of the place, and hanging on the wall, shone in the firelight. I sat down on a stool in a corner of the wide chimney-place near a squirrel, which was amusing itself by leaping from the back of a great dog to the shelf of a spinning-wheel. A little cat took possession of my knee to watch the game. The miller's wife hung a large pot on the fire, which encircled its black sides like a radiated crown of gold. While the potatoes for my supper were thus getting ready before my eyes, I amused myself in reading by the light of the fire an English newspaper which had fallen on the ground near me. Suddenly these words printed in large letters caught my eye. Flight of the King. Below was an account of the flight of Louis XVI, and of the unfortunate monarch's arrest at Varennes. The paper also related the progress of emigration, and the uniting of the officers in the army under the standards of the French princes. 
a sudden change came over my mind rinaldo saw his weakness in the mirror of honour in armida's gardens and though not tasso's hero the same mirror was held up to me in the midst of an american forest the clash of arms the tumult of the world reached my ears beneath the thatch roof of a mill buried in unknown woods i abruptly checked my course and said to myself return to france thus what appeared to me a duty overthrew my original designs and induced the first of those sudden changes by which my career has been marked the bourbons had needed not that a cadet of brittany should return from beyond seas to offer them his obscure devotion any more than they needed his services when he afterwards rose from his obscurity if i had continued my travels and lighted my pipe with the newspaper which effected such a change in my life no one would have remarked my absence my life was then as insignificant and of as little weight or importance as the smoke of my calumet it was merely an argument a decision between myself and my conscience which sent me forth upon the theatre of the world i might have done as i would since i was the only witness of the debate but of all witnesses that is the one before whom i should most fear to blush why does the recollection of the solitudes of lakes erie and ontario even to this day recur to my mind with a more lively and agreeable impression than the brilliant spectacle of the bosphorus at the time of my travels in the united states my mind was full of illusions the troubles of france originated about the same time in which i was born nothing was finished either in myself or in my country these days are full of agreeable recollections because they recall the delightful feelings inspired by domestic relations together with the enjoyments of youth fifteen years later after my travels in the levant the republic swollen with debris and tears had emptied itself like the torrent of a deluge into despotism i no longer flattered myself with chimeras my recollections taking from thenceforth their source in society and its passions were destitute of candour deceived in my two pilgrimages to the west and the east i had not discovered the north-west passage i had not carried away glory from the banks of the niagara whither i had gone to seek for it and i had left it seated on the ruins of athens having set out to be a traveller in america and returned to be a soldier in europe i finally succeeded in neither one nor the other of these careers an evil genius snatched away the staff and the sword and put a pen into my hand fifteen years later still being at sparta and contemplating the heavens during the night i call to mind the countries which i had already seen in my peaceful or my troubled sleep in the woods of germany or amid the fogs of england on the fields of italy on the open seas and in the canadian forests i had already gazed upon the same stars which i then saw shining upon the country of helen and menelaus but of what use was it to complain of the stars the motionless witnesses of my wandering destinies one day their look will no longer be weary of following me at present indifferent to my fate i shall not ask these stars to shed upon it a gentler influence or to restore to me what the traveller leaves of his life in the places through which he passes were i now to revisit the united states i should no longer recognize the country where i left forests i should find cultivated fields where i brush my way along a path through brambles i should now travel on excellent roads at natchez instead of the hut of saluta there now stands a town of five thousand inhabitants and Chactas might be to-day a member of congress i very recently received a pamphlet printed among the cherokees addressed to me as a friend of the freedom of the press with a view to promote the cause of civilization among the tribe among the muskogees the seminoles and the chickasaws there will be fine an athens a marathon a carthage a memphis a sparta and a florence a county of colombia and another of marengo the glory of all nations has furnished names for places in the same deserts where i once met father aubrey and the obscure atala kentucky contains a versailles and the district of bourbon has a paris for its capital the exiled and oppressed of all countries who have found an asylum in america have transported thither the memory of their native lands falsi simuentis ad undam libabat sinri andromache in its bosom and under the protection of liberty the united states offers an image and remembrancer of most of the celebrated places of antiquity and of modern europe in the garden of his country house near rome adrian caused a memorial of his empire to be erected thirty-three great public roads issue from washington just as the great roman roads formerly radiated from the capital having traversed the whole distance they terminate at the circumference of the united states and comprise an extent of twenty five thousand seven hundred and forty seven miles on many of these roads regular posts are established a seat in a coach may be now taken for ohio or niagara just in the same manner as in my time the traveller took a guide or an indian interpreter 
the present means of conveyance is twofold lakes and rivers exist everywhere connected by canals one may travel by the side of the roads in boats both with oars and sails in barges or steamboats fuel is inexhaustible for the immense forests grow over coal mines which in some places cross out on the surface of the ground the population of the united states increased at the rate of thirty five per cent each ten years from seventeen ninety till eighteen twenty at the same rate it will amount in eighteen thirty to twelve million eight hundred and seventy five thousand souls and by continuing to double itself every twenty five years in eighteen fifty five it will reach twenty five million seven hundred and fifty thousand and in eighteen eighty it will exceed fifty million this human sap makes the desert flourish on all sides the canadian lakes not long since without a sail now resemble basins in which frigates corvettes cutters and barks are mingled with indian canoes as large ships and galleys mingle with barges sloops and cakes in the waters of constantinople the mississippi the missouri and the ohio no longer flow on in solitude large vessels ascend their currents and more than two hundred steamboats enliven their banks this immense internal navigation which alone would suffice to ensure the prosperity of the united states does not in the least degree diminish their distant expeditions their ships traverse every sea are engaged in every species of commerce and carry the starry banner of the west along the coasts of the east which have never known anything but the horrors of slavery in order to complete this astonishing picture we must imagine such cities as boston new york philadelphia baltimore charleston savannah and new orleans well lighted by night their streets crowded with horses and carriages brilliant with coffee-houses museums libraries assembly rooms and theatres affording all the enjoyments and resources of luxury we must not however look in the united states for that which especially distinguishes man from the other beings in creation but which constitutes his highest glory and the ornament of his days literary refinement is unknown in the new republic however it may appear to be promoted by multitudes of establishments the american has substituted the practical art for intellectual culture his mediocrity however in the higher arts is not to be imputed to mental inferiority but to the want of attention to such pursuits thrown from different causes upon a desert soil agriculture and commerce have necessarily engaged his whole attention before cultivating the taste it was necessary to provide for the sustenance of the body before planting trees it was necessary to cut them down in order to clear the ground for tillage the early colonists with their minds full of religious controversies carried with them it is true a passion for disputation into the bosom of the forest but they found it necessary to make the axe the first implement for the conquest of the desert having nothing better than the trunk of a hewn tree as a pulpit in their intervals of labour the americans have not passed through the regular gradations of age like other nations they have left their childhood and youth in europe the prattling of the cradle has been a thing unknown they have only enjoyed the pleasures of a home in their regret for a country which they have never seen whose eternal absence they have deplored and the delights of which have only reached them from ancestral traditions the new world possesses neither a classical a romantic nor an indian literature in classical literature the americans have no models in romance they have no middle age in indian literature they look with contempt upon the native savages and look with horror upon the woods as they would upon a prison thus in america there is no trace of literature properly so called what is to be found is the applied sciences the literature which affects the various uses of social life the literature of artisans merchants sailors and agriculturists the americans have little success except in mechanics and the applied sciences franklin and fulton have drawn means of human improvement from the thundercloud and from steam it was the honour of america to enrich the world with a discovery which henceforth will open up all the coasts of the world to the researches of science and the influence of commerce poetry and imagination which fall to the lot of a very small number of those exempt from the labours of life are regarded in the united states as the puerilities of youth and of old age the americans have never had a youth and have not yet attained to old age hence it follows that men engaged in serious studies have been necessarily obliged to mix in the business of their country in order to acquire knowledge of its interests and that they have also been necessarily actors in their revolution it is however melancholy to remark the rapid degeneracy of talent from the early promoters of the american disturbances to those of these latter times although they are but a generation apart the early presidents of the republic possessed a religious character simple dignified and calm of which no trace whatever is to be found in the bloody phrase of our republic and empire the solitudes with which the americans were surrounded reacted upon their nature they effected their liberty in silence the farewell address of general washington to the people of the united states might well have been pronounced by the most distinguished man of antiquity 
the public record says the general prove to what extent the principles which i have just stated have been the guides of my conduct in the discharge of my public duties my conscience at least assures me that i have followed them and although in examining again the acts of my administration i am not conscious of any intentional faults yet i am too deeply sensible of my defects not to be convinced that i have probably fallen into many mistakes whatever these may be i fervently implore the almighty to remove or dissipate the evils to which they may have led i shall also carry with me the hope that my country will never cease to look upon them with indulgence and that after forty-five years of my life devoted to her service with zeal and integrity the wrongs of my humble merit will be forgotten as i shall soon myself be gathered to the house of all living after the death of one of his two children jefferson writes from monticello as follows the loss which i have experienced is really great others may lose of their abundance but i have to deplore the loss of the one half of my whole portion the evening of my life is only held together by the slender threads of one human life perhaps i am destined to see the last bond of paternal affection broken philosophy which is rarely affecting is so here in the very highest degree this was none of the indolent grief of a man who was exempt from the active occupations of life jefferson died on the fourth of july eighteen twenty six in the eighty-fourth year of his age and the fifty-fourth of the independence of his country his mortal remains repose covered with a simple stone on which as his only epitaph is engraved the following inscription thomas jefferson author of the declaration of independence pericles and demosthenes pronounced the funeral orations of some young greeks who fell for a people which disappeared soon after them in eighteen seventeen brackenridge celebrated the death of some young americans whose blood has given birth to a people there exists a national gallery of portraits of distinguished americans in four volumes octavo and what is remarkable is a biography containing the lives of more than a hundred of the principal indian chiefs logan the chief of virginia spoke the following address to lord dunmore last spring colonel crafts without any provocation slew all the kindred of logan there no longer flows a single drop of my blood in the veins of any living creature it is this which has called me to vengeance i have sought him i have slain many is there any one who will now come and lament for the death of logan none without loving nature the americans have applied themselves to the study of natural history townsend set out from philadelphia and explored on foot the whole country between the atlantic and the pacific and enriched his journal with numerous observations thomas say who travelled in the floridas and to the rocky mountains has published a work on american entomology wilson originally a weaver became an author and has furnished some very finished delineations in reference to literature properly so called although there is little worth notice there are some names which cannot be altogether overlooked brown the son of a quaker is the author of wieland which wieland has become the source and model of the novel writers of the new school in opposition to the tendencies of his countrymen brown alleges that he prefers wandering in the forest to beating out corn Wieland, the hero of his story, is a Puritan whom heaven has commanded to kill his wife. I have brought you here, says he, to fulfil the commands of God. By my hands you must die, and I seized her two arms. She uttered the most piercing shrieks and attempted to get free. Wieland, am not I your wife? Do you wish to kill me? To kill me? Mercy, mercy! As long as she could utter a sound, she continued to beg for mercy and for aid. Wieland strangles his wife and experiences unspeakable delights beside the dead body of his victim the horrors of our modern inventors are here surpassed brown had formed his taste by reading caleb williams and in his wieland he has transferred into his book a scene from othello at the present time the american novelists cooper and washington irving are obliged to come to europe to find materials and readers the language of the great english writers has been creolized provincialized and barbarized without having gained anything in energy in the midst of a virgin nature it has been found necessary to publish lists of americanisms as to the american poets their language has something pleasing but they rise but little beyond mediocrity however the ode to the evening breeze sunrise on the mountain the torrent and some others are worth reading halleck has sung botzar is dying and george hill has wandered amongst the ruins of greece it is a pleasure to me who have been a traveller on the shores of hellas and atlantis to hear the independent voice of a country unknown to the ancients lamenting over the lost liberties of the old world End of chapter 34
Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to 1800, Part 2, by François René de Chateaubriand, Chapter 35. Dangers incident to the United States. Will America retain its present form of government? Will not the state separate? Has not a representative from Virginia already maintained the cause of ancient liberty with slaves, the result of paganism, against a representative from Massachusetts, upholding the cause of modern liberty without slaves, such as Christianity has made it? Are not the northern and central states opposed both in feeling and interests? Will not the western states, so far removed from the Atlantic, desire a government of their own? Is the federal bond, on the one hand, strong enough to maintain the union, and to constrain the obedience of the neighbouring states. On the other, if the power of the executive be increased, will not the presidential power become a despotism with the guards and privileges of a dictator? The isolation of the United States has been favourable to their origin and greatness. It is very doubtful whether such a state could have sprung up and grown to maturity in Europe. Federal Switzerland existed in the midst of us. Why? It is small, poor, and girdled round with lofty mountains the forcing-house of soldiers for the use of kings, and the scene of excursions of pleasure. Completely separated from the old world, the population of the United States still dwell in solitude. Its deserts have constituted its freedom. But even now the conditions of its position begin to change. The existence of the democracies of Mexico, Colombia, Peru, Chile, and Buenos Aires, all in a state of disturbance as they are, constitute a danger. As long as the United States had no other neighbours but the colonies of a transatlantic kingdom, there was no probability of any serious war. At present the rivalries of the new states are a subject of apprehension. In proportion as recourse is had to arms among them, and as the descendants of Washington become imbued with a military spirit, there is danger of some great captain springing up, who will aim at a throne. Glory always has a desire for crowns. I have already observed that the interests of the northern, central, and western states are different. Each of them is aware of the fact. Should any of these divisions violate the Union, will there be an attempt to reduce it to obedience by force of arms? Then what a multitude of enmities will be spread in the social Union? What discords will immediately break out in these emancipated states? These transatlantic republics being broken up will only form weak units of no weight in the social scale, or they will be successively subjugated by some one amongst them. In these remarks I lay out of view the serious question of foreign alliances and interventions. Kentucky, inhabited by a race of men more rustic, hardy, and warlike than the rest, seems destined to be a conquering state. In such a state, if it should prove successful and victorious, the power of an individual would not be long in gaining a complete ascendancy and in rising upon the ruins of the power of all. So much for the dangers of war. Those of a long peace ought also to be borne in mind. Since their emancipation, the United States have enjoyed, with very short exceptions, a period of the most profound tranquillity. Whilst hundreds of battles were shaking Europe to its centre, they were engaged in cultivating their fields in peace. The consequence of this has been an immense development of population and wealth, with all the inconvenience of a superabundance of riches and population. Should hostilities arise amongst an unwarlike people, would they know how to resist? with their wealth and habits would they consent to make the necessary sacrifices how could they bring themselves to renounce their indolent customs their comforts and the quiet enjoyments of life china and india reposing in their muslins have constantly submitted to foreign domination that which is most suited to the nature and advancement of a free society is a state of peace moderated by war and a state of war tempered by peace the americans have already worn the olive crown too long the tree which produces it is not indigenous to their soil. The spirit of trade begins to overrun them, and self-interest is even now become a national vice. The spirit of gambling in their banking systems has already involved them in difficulties, and bankruptcies threaten the public wheel. As long as liberty produces gold, an industrious republic effects prodigies, but when gold has been acquired or is exhausted, it loses that love of independence, which is not founded on a moral sentiment, but has originated in a thirst for money and a passion for industry. Moreover, it is difficult to create a country among states which have no community either in religion or material interests, which have sprung from various sources at different times and live in a different soil and climate. What common relation is there between a Frenchman of Louisiana, a Spaniard from the Floridas, a German from New York, an Englishman from New England, Virginia, Carolina or Georgia, all of them reputed Americans? 
the first is a light-minded dualist the second an indolent and haughty catholic the third an industrious lutheran without slaves the last an english planter with negroes or a puritan and merchant how many centuries it will require to make these elements homogeneous an aristocracy of money is ready to appear with the love of distinctions and a passion for titles it is quite erroneous to suppose that there exists anything resembling a general level in the united states they are societies wholly exclusive in their nature they are drawing-rooms in which the haughtiness of their masters very far surpasses that of a german prince with his sixteen quarterings these plebeian nobles aspire to be a caste in despite of the progress of knowledge which has made them equal and free some of them never speak of anything but their ancestors proud barons apparently bastards and companions of william the bastard they display the blazonry of the chivalry of the old world adorned with the serpents the lizards and parroquets of the new a gascon cadet landing merely with his cloak and umbrella on their republican shores if he takes care to give himself the title of marquis is received with consideration on board the american steamboats the enormous inequality of fortune threatens more seriously still to destroy the spirit of equality individual americans possess one or two millions of income thus the yankees of high society can no longer live after the fashion of franklin the true gentleman disgusted with the habits of his new country travels to europe to seek for those of the old and he is to be found in every hotel making the tour of italy and vying with the english in extravagance or the spleen these wanderers from carolina and virginia purchase ruined abbeys in france and plant english gardens with american trees at melun naples sends to new york her singers and performers paris her fashions and strollers london her grooms and her boxes exotic enjoyments which do not render the union more cheerful people as an amusement threw themselves into the cataract of niagara with the immense applause of fifty thousand half-savage planters what is still more extraordinary is that at the same time that this inequality of fortune is in process of development and an aristocracy begins to be formed the great equality impulse from without compels the great and wealthy manufacturing proprietors or capitalists to conceal their luxury and to dissemble their riches for fear of being assassinated by their neighbours no regard whatever is paid to the executive power local authorities are removed from office although they are persons of their own choice and new authorities are put in their stead order is not however disturbed practical democracy is observed whilst men laugh at laws passed by the same democracy in theory the bonds of family feeling scarcely exist as soon as the child is in a condition to work he must set about and fly with his own wings like a fledged bird from these generations emancipated by a premature orphanhood and the emigrants who are constantly arriving from europe nomad companies are formed who clear the lands dig canals and carry their industry everywhere without attaching themselves to the soil they commence houses in the desert where the fleeting occupant will not remain more than a few days their towns are the abodes of a cold and hard egotism piastres and dollars banknotes and money the rise or fall of the funds constitute the staple of all conversation a man might suppose himself on the exchange or in the counting-house of some great establishment the newspapers of huge dimensions are filled with details of trade and commerce or with idle rumours and small talk will the americans without knowing it submit to the law of a climate in which vegetable nature appears to have flourished at the expense of living nature a law contended against by many distinguished men but the regulation of which has not by any means been placed beyond inquiry and examination it might be a fair subject of inquiry whether america has not been too soon experienced in philosophical liberty as russia has been in a civilized despotism in short the united states give the idea of a colony and not of a mother country they have no past their manners and morals are not the fruits of their laws the citizens of the new world took their rank among nations just at the time when political ideas were entering into the ascendant phase and this explains why they have changed with such extraordinary rapidity anything like a permanent condition of society seems to have become impracticable amongst them on the one hand from the extreme ennui of individuals and on the other from the impossibility of remaining in any fixed place and the necessity of movement which controls and urges them on for people can never be stationary when their household gods are continually wandering situated on the highway of oceans and at the head of progressive opinions as new as his country the american seems to have received from columbus rather the mission of discovering new worlds than of creating them End of chapter thirty five Chapter thirty six of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, part two. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768-1800, Part 2, by François-René de Chateaubriand, Chapter 36. London, from April till September, 1822. Return to Europe, Escape from Shipwreck. On my return from the wilds to Philadelphia, having hastily noted down on the way, like La Fontaine's old man, the observations I have just related, I was disappointed by not finding there the remittances which I expected. This was the beginning of the pecuniary embarrassments in which I have ever since been plunged. Fortune and I began to quarrel as soon as we caught sight of each other. Herodotus gives an account of certain Indian ants which collected together heaps of gold. According to Athenaeus, the sun gave Hercules a golden ship in which to reach the island of Erythia, the retreat of the Hesperides. Although an ant, I have not the honour of belonging to the great Indian family, and although a sailor, I never crossed the water in any other vessel than one made of pine. It was one of this kind which brought me back from America to Europe. The captain gave me my passage on credit. On the 10th of December, 1791, I embarked with several of my fellow countrymen, who were returning, like myself, to France from various motives. The ship was bound for Havre. A westerly gale caught us at the mouth of the Delaware, and carried us across the Atlantic in seventeen days, often scudding under bare poles. It was with great difficulty that the ship could be brought to. The sun never once shone on us. The vessel, steering by a dead reckoning, was swept along before the surge. I crossed the ocean in the midst of shadows. Never did it appear to me so sad. I myself was even more sad. I had been deceived and disappointed in my first outset in life. Palaces are not built on the seas, says the Persian poet, Ferid Edin. I felt an indescribable weight at my heart, as of the approach of some great misfortune. Gazing over the waves, I tried to read my destiny in them, or wrote, more annoyed by the motion they caused than fearful of their threats. Instead of diminishing as we neared Europe, the tempest increased in force, but it blew in an equal continuous gale, and from the uniformity of its rage resulted a sort of angry calm in the pale sky and leaden sea. The captain, not having been able to sound, became uneasy. He went up into the shrouds and looked through his glass at the different points of the horizon. A lookout was stationed on the bowsprit, and another on the main-top mast cross-trees. The sea became short, and the colour of the water changed. Signs of land. But of what land? The Breton sailors have a proverb. Celui qui voit Belle-Île, voit son île. Celui qui voit Goua, voit sa joie. Celui qui voit Ouesson, voit son son. I had spent two nights walking on deck amidst the hissing of the waves in the darkness, the whistling of the wind in the rigging, and the constant dashing of the sea over the deck. All around us was one wild tumult of waters. At the beginning of the third night, wearied with the shocks and motion of the vessel, I retired to bed. The weather was dreadful. My hammock creaked and swung with the dash of the sea, which continually broke over the ship, seeming as if it would shake her very planks asunder. I heard coils of cordage falling on all parts of the deck and felt the peculiar motion experienced when a ship goes about. The hatchway over the ladder between decks was open, and a voice, as of someone in fear, called to the captain. This voice, heard through the darkness and the roar of the tempest, had something terrible in its sound. I listened, and thought I heard the sailors discussing the bearing of a coast. I threw myself out of my hammock. At that moment a wave burst into the quarter-deck and inundated the captain's cabin. Tables, beds, chests, furniture, and arms rolled over pell-mell, and I gained the deck half-drowned. On emerging from the hatchway, a sublime spectacle was presented to my eyes. The vessel had tried to put about, but not having been able to succeed, had been driven to leeward. The fitful light of the moon, now emerging from a mass of clouds, then instantly hidden again, showed on either side of us, through a yellow base, lines of coast bristling with rocks. The sea threw up waves like mountains in the canal in which we lay engulfed. Sometimes their summits foamed and glittered with sparks of fire, at others presented an oily vitreous surface, marbled with black, copper-coloured or greenish spots, according to the colour of the bottom which they lashed. For a few moments the noise of the abyss of waters and of the wind were mingled in one confusion of sound, but a moment after we could distinguish the flow of the currents, the hissing noise on the reefs, and the roar of the distant surge. From the hold of the vessel issued sounds which made the hearts of the stoutest sailors quake. The ship's prow met the thick mass of waves with a fearful crash and torrents of water rushed foaming from the helm as from the opening of a sluice. Amidst this tumult nothing was so alarming as a certain dull, murmuring sound, like a vase filling. Lighted by a cresset and kept down by leads, 
books of navigation charts and ship's courses were spread out on a hen-coop the gale had extinguished the binnacle lamp every one had a different opinion about the land in sight we had entered the channel without perceiving it the ship reeling with every wave was drifting between the isles of guernsey and alderney shipwreck appeared inevitable and the passengers held fast what they most prized to save it with themselves there were some french sailors among the crew one of them in default of a chaplain raised that hymn to notre dame le bon secours which had been the earliest lesson of my childhood i now repeated it in sight of the coast of brittany almost under the eyes of my mother the protestant american sailors joined heartily in the chant of their catholic french comrades danger teaches men their weakness and unites their prayers passengers and crew all were crowded together on deck some clinging to the rigging some to the side some to the capstern some to the bills of the anchors to prevent themselves from being swept away by the surge or thrown into the sea by the heaving of the vessel the captain cried a hatchet a hatchet to cut away the masts and the rudder the tiller having been abandoned swung hither and thither with a harsh grating sound one attempt might yet be made to save us the lead showed only four fathoms of water on a bank of sand crossing the current it was possible that the surge might lift us over this bank and float us in deep water but who would venture to seize the helm and take the safety of the whole crew into his own hands one false turn of the helm and we were lost one of those men who spring from events the spontaneous offspring of peril came forward a new york sailor took the deserted post of the steersman i still see him in his shirt and canvas trousers with his bare feet and flying wet hair holding the tiller in his strong grasp while with his head turned he watched the approach of the wave which was to save or destroy us the mountain of water embracing the whole of the channel in which we lay came rolling along in one unbroken mass like one sea invading another large white birds with their calm flight preceded it like birds of death the vessel struck and heeled not a word was spoken but every face was blanched the wave reached us at the very moment it touched the vessel our helmsman gave the turn to the rudder the ship which was just ready to fall over on her side presented her stern and the very wave which seemed about to engulf lifted and carried us on its crest soundings were taken and showed seventeen fathoms a loud huzzah burst from all lips we added the cry vive le roi heaven heard it not for louis the sixteenth it only profited ourselves though now disengaged from the two islands we were not out of danger we could not succeed in turning the point of the northern coast at length the retiring tide carried us with it and redoubled cap de la Argue. I had experienced no terror during this near approach to shipwreck, and felt no joy at having been saved. It is far better to yield up life while one is young, than to be forced to yield it by time. The next day we reached Havre. The whole population crowded to see us. Our topmasts were broken, our boats carried away, our poop cut down, and we shipped water at every pitch of the vessel. I landed on the jetty. On the 2nd of January, 1792, I again trod my native soil, once more destined to vanish before my gaze. I brought with me not any Eskimo from the polar regions, but two savages of an unknown race, Chaktas and Atala. End of chapter 36。Chapter 37 of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to 1800, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, part two, by Francois Rene de Chateaubriand, chapter thirty seven. London from April till September, eighteen twenty two. Revised in December, eighteen forty six. I go to my mother at Saint Malo. Progress of the Revolution, my marriage. I wrote from Havre to my brother in Paris, giving the details of my voyage, explaining the motives of my return, and requesting him to lend me the sum necessary to pay my passage. He replied that he had sent my letter to my mother. She did not keep me waiting, but put me in a condition to pay my debts and quit Havre. In her letter she informed me that Lucille was with her, and also my uncle, the Count de Bedet, and his family. This news determined me to go to Saint-Malo, where I could consult my uncle on the subject of my approaching emigration. Revolutions, like rivers, swell as they flow. I found the one I had left in France enormously enlarged, and overflowing its banks. I had left it with Mirabeau under La Constituante, I found it with Danton under la législative. The news of the Treaty of Pilnitz of the 27th of August, 1791, had reached Paris. On the 14th of December, while I was in the midst of Tempest, the king announced that he had written to the princes of the Germanic body, especially to the elector of Treves, on the subject of the German armaments. The king's brothers, the Prince de Condé, Monsieur de Calon, Viscount Mirabeau, and Monsieur de Cré, 
were immediately accused a previous decree of the ninth of november had been directed against the other emigres and it was in these already proscribed ranks that i was hastening to place myself others would perhaps have recoiled but the right of the strongest always inclines me to take the side of the weakest the pride of victory is to me insupportable on my way from Havre to st malo i had opportunity to note the divisions and misfortunes of france chateau burned or abandoned the proprietors scared by threats had made their escape the women had taken refuge in the towns the hamlets and small towns groaned under the tyranny of clubs connected with the central club of the cordeliers afterwards united to the jacobins the antagonist to this club the société monarchique or société des fouillons was no longer in existence the ignoble denomination of sans culottes had become popular the king was called nothing but monsieur vito or monsieur capet i was tenderly received by my mother and the rest of my family who nevertheless deplored the inopportuneness of my return my uncle the count de Bede, was preparing to go to jersey with his wife his sons and his daughters the question was how to find funds to enable me to join the princess my voyage to america had made a breach in my fortune my property was almost annihilated in my portion as younger son by the suppression of the feudal rights the small benefices which should have fallen to me in virtue of my admission into the order of malta had been seized by the nation along with the other possessions of the clergy this concurrence of circumstances decided on the gravest act of my life i was made to marry in order to procure myself the means of going to risk my life in upholding a cause for which i had no love there lived in retirement at st malo a certain monsieur de lavigne a knight of st louis and formerly commandant of l'orient the count d'artois had been his guest at the latter town when he visited brittany and had been so charmed with his host that he promised to grant him anything he might in future like to ask this monsieur de lavigne had two sons one of them married mademoiselle de la placeliere two daughters the children of this marriage were early left orphans by the death of both parents the eldest married count du plessis pascal commander of a vessel the son and grandson of an admiral now himself rear admiral of the red and commandant of the naval college at brest the younger still lived with her grandfather and was seventeen years old at the time of my return from america she was fair and delicate in complexion slight in figure and very pretty her fair hair fell in natural curls on her neck like a child's her fortune was reckoned at five or six hundred thousand francs my sisters took it into their heads to make me marry mademoiselle de lavigne who had strongly attached herself to lucile the affair was conducted without my knowledge i had not seen mademoiselle de lavigne more than three or four times i knew her at a distance on the sillon by her rose-coloured pelisse her white dress and fair hair floating in the wind when i was sitting on the strand enjoying the embraces of my first love the sea i felt no qualification for the position of husband all my illusions were still vivid and unfaded none were yet exhausted on the contrary the energy of my existence seemed to have redoubled during my wanderings i was tormented by the muse lucile was fond of mademoiselle de lavigne and saw an independent fortune for me in this marriage be it as you like then said i in my character the public man is immovable the private man at the mercy of any one who wishes to influence him to avoid the bickering of an hour i would enslave myself for a century the consent of the grandfather the paternal uncle and the principal relations was easily obtained the only opponent was a maternal uncle m de vauvert a great democrat he is greatly against the marriage of his niece with an aristocrat like me yet i was not one at all it was thought that the matter might proceed without his consent but my pious mother insisted that the religious marriage should be performed by a priest non assermenté and this could only be done in secret m vauvert heard of it and set the magistracy upon us under pretext of abduction and violation of the law bringing forward the pretended dotage into which the grandfather m de lavigne had fallen mademoiselle de lavigne now become madame de chateaubriand without my having had any communication with her was carried off in the name of justice and put into the convent of la victoire in st malo pending the decision of the tribunals there was neither abduction nor violation of the law nor adventure nor romance of love in the whole affair the marriage only possessed the unattractive side of romance truth the cause was pleaded and the tribunal had judged the marriage valid in a civil point of view the families being agreed on the matter m de vauvert desisted from his opposition the constitutional curate liberally paid no longer exclaimed against the first nuptial benediction and madame de chateaubriand quitted the convent whither she had been accompanied by lucile i had now a new acquaintance to make and she proved all that i could desire i know not that there has ever existed a finer intelligence than my wife's she divines the thought and the word on the brow and lip of the person with whom she is conversing to deceive her in anything is impossible 
possessing an original and cultivated mind curious and inquiring in the most piquant way relating anything with wondrous cleverness madame de chateaubriand admires me without ever having read two lines of my works she would fear to meet in them with ideas differing from her own or to discover that the rest of the world is not enthusiastic enough in its estimate of me although an impassioned judge she is a well-informed and good one madame de chateaubriand's faults if she has any flow from the superabundance of her qualities my very real faults result from the sterility of mine it is easy to have resignation patience general obligingness of manner and serenity of temper when one takes interest in nothing becomes weary of everything and replies to misfortune as to good fortune by a desperate and despairing what does it matter madame de chateaubriand is better than i although of less easy intercourse have i been irreproachable in my conduct towards her have i given to my companion in life's journey all those feelings which she deserved and to which she had a right what happiness has she enjoyed in return for an affection which has never belied itself she has shared my adversity has been plunged into the dungeons of the reign of terror suffered the persecutions of the empire and the disgraces of the restoration and has not found in maternal joys a compensation for her troubles without children with whom perhaps in another union she would have been blessed and whom she would have loved to excess not receiving the honours or living in the atmosphere of tenderness surrounding the mother of a family and consoling her for the loss of her youth she has advanced childless and solitary towards old age often separated from me and with a distaste to literature the pride of bearing my name is not a sufficient compensation timid and trembling for me alone her constantly arising fears deprive her of sleep and of time to recover her health i am her permanent infirmity and the cause of her relapses can i for a moment weigh a few little irritations which she has caused me against the care and anxiety i have caused her or compare my qualities such as they are with her virtues which feed the poor which have established the infirmary of maria theresa in spite of every obstacle what are my labours beside her christian works when we both appear before the supreme tribunal i shall be the one to be condemned and in conclusion when i consider the whole tendency and imperfection of my nature is it certain that marriage has been the bane of my destiny i should doubtless have enjoyed more leisure and repose I should have been better received in certain circles and by certain high ones of the earth. But if Madame de Chateaubriand has differed with me in politics, she has never prevented my following my own path, because in that, as in the matter of honour, I judge solely by my own feelings. Should I have produced a greater number of works had I remained independent, and would these works have been better? Have not circumstances occurred, as will hereafter be seen, in which, marrying out of France, I would have ceased to write, and would have renounced my country? If I had not married, would not my weakness have given me up a prey to some unworthy object of attachment? Should I not have squandered and degraded my hours like Lord Byron? Now that I am growing old, all my follies would be past. I would have left nothing behind but regrets and a painful void. I should be an old bachelor, esteemed by none, either continuing to be deceived or painfully undeceived, an old bird repeating a worn-out song to inattentive ears. The full license of my ideas would not have added a chord to my lyre, or an accent of deeper feeling to my voice the restraint of my feelings the mystery of my thoughts have perhaps added to the power of my accents and animated my writings with an inward fever a hidden flame which would have been dissipated in the free air of love bound by an indissoluble tie i purchased with a little bitterness at first the enjoyments i now taste of the evils of my existence i have only retained the incurable portion tender and eternal gratitude do i owe then to my wife whose attachment has been as touching as it has been profound and sincere she has rendered my life of more weight and value more noble and more honourable by always inspiring me with respect for duty if not always making me feel its full force End of chapter thirty seven chapter thirty eight of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768-1800, Part 2, by François René de Chateaubriand, Chapter 38. London, from April till September, 1822. Paris. Old and New Acquaintances. The Abbé Barthélemy. Saint-Ange. The Theatre. I was married at the end of March, 1792. On the 20th of April the legislative assembly declared war against francis the second who had just succeeded his father leopold on the tenth of the same month benoit labre had been canonized at rome 
here were two different worlds the war drove the rest of the nobility out of france on the one hand the persecutions of the royalists redoubled in violence on the other the royalists could not attempt to remain peacefully at home without being reputed cowards it became necessary for me to set out to seek the camp i had come so far to join my uncle de bedet and his family left for jersey and i went to paris with my wife and my two sisters lucile and julie we had secured apartments in the little hotel de villette cul de sac ferou faubourg saint germain i hastened to seek out my former circle of acquaintance among the new faces i noticed those of the learned abbe barthelemy and the poet saint ange the abbe's description of the gymnasia of athens bears too strong a resemblance to the salons of chanteloup the translator of ovid was not a man without talent talent is a gift an isolated thing it may be combined with other faculties or it may exist separately from them saint ange was a proof of this he held himself high in order not to display his folly but he displayed it nevertheless unavoidably bernardin de saint pierre a man whose works i then admired and still admire was wanting in intellect and unfortunately his character was on a level with his intellect how many pictures in the etude de la nature are spoiled by the limited intelligence by the deficiency of true elevation of soul in the writer rulier had died suddenly in seventeen ninety one before my departure for america i have since seen his little house at st denis with the fountain and the pretty statue of love on the pedestal of which the following lines are inscribed d'egmont avec l'amour visita cette rive in image de sa beauté se peignit un moment sur l'onde fugitive d'egmont a disparu l'amour seul est resté when i quitted france the theatres of paris were still resounding with the reveil d'epimenide and with this verse j'aime la vertu guerrière de nos braves de Français. mais d'un peuple sanguinaire je déteste les fureurs à l'europe redoutable soyons libres à jamais et soyons toujours aimables et gardons l'esprit français on my return the reveil de pimenide was no longer to be heard of and if the verse had been sung the author would have suffered for it charles neuf had prevailed it was principally the circumstances of the time which caused such a mania for this piece the tocsin a people armed with daggers the hatred of kings and priests offered a private repetition of the tragedy which was being publicly enacted talma then a debutant continued to succeed while tragedy was staining the streets pastorals flourished at the theatres there one was greeted only by innocent shepherds and modest shepherdesses fields brooks meadows lambs doves the age of gold in the hut were revived to the sight of the shepherd's pipe before the cooing tiercis and the naive tricoteurs who had just come from watching the guillotine if samson had had time he would have played the part of colin and mademoiselle tyrone de merico that of babet the conventionalists piqued themselves on being the most benign of men good fathers good sons good husbands they took their little children out to walk filled the place of nurses to them wept with tenderness at their simple games and took these little lambs gently in their arms to show them the dada of the guillotine carts and taking his victims to execution they sang of nature peace pity beneficence candour and the domestic virtues these saintly philanthropists cut their neighbours throats with extreme sensibility for the supreme happiness and welfare of the human race End of chapter 38 End of part 2chapter one of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter one london from april till september eighteen twenty two revised december eighteen forty six change in the appearance of paris club of the cordelier marat in 1792 paris no longer exhibited the same appearance as in 1789 and 1790 it was no longer the new-born revolution but a people intoxicated rushing on to fulfil its destiny across abysses and by devious ways the appearance of the people was no longer tumultuous curious and eager but threatening terrified or fierce men were to be met in every street persons who stole quietly along close by the houses in order to escape notice or who were roaming about in search of their prey their timid and downcast looks were either turned away from you or fixed upon yours in order to scrutinize and thoroughly penetrate you all variety of costume had disappeared 
the dress of former times was wholly displaced and every one had adopted the uniform apparel of the new social condition even apparel which was then only the latest clothing of those destined to future condemnation the social license manifested at the regeneration of france the liberties of seventeen eighty nine those fantastic and wild liberties of an order of things which is self-destructive and nothing better than anarchy had already brought everything to the same level under the sway of the empire of the people there was on all hands abundant evidence of the approach of a young plebeian tyranny fertile it is true and filled with hopes but in other respects as much to be dreaded as the fallen despotism of the old royalty the sovereign people being everywhere when it becomes a tyrant the tyrant is everywhere it is the universal presence of a universal tiberius the population of paris was mixed up with a strange population of cutthroats from the south the advance guard of the marseillais whom danton was drawing together in paris for the tenth of august and the massacres of september these newcomers were easily known by their rags their bronzed faces and the appearance of idleness and crime but the crimes of a different climate in vultu vitium wickedness in their countenances in the legislative assembly i recognized no one mirabeau and the first idols of our disturbances were either no longer in existence or had lost their altars in order however to resume the thread of history broken by my voyage to america i must revert to things of a somewhat earlier date retrospect the king's flight on the twenty first of june seventeen ninety one gave an immense impulse to the revolution having been brought back to paris on the twenty fifth of the same month he was dethroned for the first time in consequence of the declaration of the national assembly that all its decrees should have the force of law without the king's concurrence or assent a high court of justice intended to replace a revolutionary tribunal had been established at orleans from that time forth madame roland was urgent for the beheading of the queen in anticipation of the time when the revolution should demand her own the assembly in the champ de mars had taken place to protest against the decrees which suspended the king from the exercise of his functions instead of bringing him to trial the acceptance of the constitution on the fourteenth of september had no effect in calming the storm the question then was the deposition of louis the sixteenth which if it had taken place would have spared the crime of the twenty first of january the condition of the french people was changed in relation to the monarchy and to posterity the members of the constituent assembly who opposed the king's deposition thought to save his crown and they lost it those who thought to destroy it by demanding his deposition would have saved it so it is almost always in politics the result is contrary to the anticipation on the thirtieth of the same month of september seventeen ninety one the constituent assembly held its last sitting the unwise decree of the seventeenth of the preceding may which rendered the retiring members ineligible for the subsequent assembly begot the convention nothing can be more dangerous more unsuitable or more inapplicable to public affairs than resolutions directed against individuals or bodies even when these resolutions are themselves honourable the decree of the twenty ninth of september for the regulation of popular assemblies only served to render them more violent this was the last act of the constituent assembly it separated on the next day and left to france a revolution the legislative assembly clubs the legislative assembly which was installed on the first of october seventeen ninety one was carried along by the whirlwind which was about to sweep away the living and the dead popular commotions led to shedding of blood in the departments at caen the people were gorged with massacre and devoured the heart of m de Bazance. the decree against the emigres and that against the non-juring clergy which deprived them of all rights were vetoed by the king these legal acts increased the agitation petion had become mayor of paris on the first of january seventeen ninety two the deputies passed a decree for the trial of the emigrated princes and on the second they resolved that this same first of january was to be reckoned as the first day of the year of liberty four about the thirteenth of february the red caps made their appearance in the streets of paris and the municipality caused pikes to be fabricated the manifesto of the emigres was issued on the first of march austria had recourse to arms paris was divided into sections more or less hostile to one another on the twentieth of march seventeen ninety two the legislative assembly adopted that sepulchral machine without which the judgments of the reign of terror could not have been carried into effect the instrument was first tried upon dead bodies in order to learn from them the execution of its work this machine may indeed be spoken of as an executioner since persons delighted with its valuable services dedicated sums of money for its support as testimonies of their respect the invention of such a murderous instrument at the very moment in which its services became so necessary to crime is a memorable proof of the mode in which events are coordinate to one another 
or rather a proof of those hidden means employed by providence when the whole face of empires is destined to be changed at the instigation of the girondin roland was called to be minister and member of the king's council on the twentieth of april war was declared against the king of hungary and bohemia marat published the ami du peuple in spite of the decree specially directed against him the royal german regiment and that of becchini deserted is now who was busy speaking about the treachery of the court while jean sonnet and brissot denounced the austrian committee an insurrection broke out in reference to the royal guard which was disbanded on the twenty eighth of may the assembly declared its sittings permanent the palace of the tuileries was forced by the masses of the faubourg saint antoine and marceau on the twentieth of june on pretext of louis the sixteenth's refusal to sanction the proscription of the priests the king's life was exposed to peril the country was declared to be in danger m de lafayette was burned in effigy the confederates of the second federation were arriving the marseillais on the invitation of danton were on their march they entered paris on the thirtieth of july and were lodged by pétion in the convent of the cordeliers the cordeliers along with the national tribune two others had been concurrently established that of the jacobins and that of the cordeliers the latter being at that time the most formidable because it furnished members for the famous common council of paris and provided it with a means of action had the formation of this council not taken place paris for want of a given point of concentration would have become divided and the different wards with their local officers been rival powers the club of the cordeliers was established in the monastery of that name the church of which had been built in the year twelve fifty nine in the reign of st louis with money given as reparation for murder in fifteen ninety it became the resort of the most celebrated adherents of the league there are places which appear to be the laboratory of factions notice was given says l'etoile july twelfth fifteen ninety three to the duke de mayenne of two hundred cordeliers having arrived in paris furnishing themselves with arms and coming to an understanding with the sixteen who held their daily councils in the cordeliers of paris on that day the sixteen assembled at the cordeliers laid down their arms thus the fanatical leaguers had yielded up to our philosophical revolutionists the convent of the cordeliers as a dead house the pictures the sculptured or painted images the veils and curtains of the convent had been torn down the church stripped of its ornaments presented nothing to the eye except its skeleton angles in the apsis of the church where the wind and the rain entered through the broken and unglazed windows the workshop of a carpenter was made to serve as an office for the president when the sittings were held in the church in these workshops the red caps were laid aside which every orator wore when he mounted the tribune to address the assembly the tribune itself consisted of four small beams laid crosswise in the form of an x supported by props at whose intersections boards were laid down like a scaffold behind the president stood a statue of liberty surrounded by the pretended instruments of ancient justice then supplanted by a single bloody machine just as various complicated machinery has been supplanted by the hydraulic ram the club of the exalted jacobins borrowed some of its arrangements from the cordelier orators the orators of the clubs united for destruction had no common understanding either with respect to the chiefs to be chosen or the means to be employed they discoursed with beggars pickpockets robbers and murderers in the midst of the storms of hisses and hootings of these different groups of devils their metaphors were selected from the materials of murder borrowed from the foulest objects of all kinds connected with the slaughter-house and the dunghill or drawn from places appropriated to the prostitution of men and women their gesticulations made these objects sensible everything was called by its own name with the cynicism of dogs in an impious and obscene procession of oaths and blasphemies in the midst of this savage cant with which the ears were assailed and stunned nothing was to be gathered but the sounds of destruction and production death and generation the declaimers with voices like hailstorms or thunder were interrupted by others besides their opponents the small black doors of this convent without monks and of the tower without bells sported in and out of the broken windows hoping for prey and thus interrupted the speeches they were at first called to order by the useless ringing of the president's bell but not ceasing from their screeching recourse was had to firearms to reduce them to silence they fell palpitating and wounded prophets of evil in the midst of the pandemonium torn down timbers rickety benches dismantled stalls and trunks of saints served as standing places for the spectators covered with dust and mud drunk and sweating with pikes over their shoulders or their naked arms crossed the ugliest of the band always obtained a preference in obtaining leave to speak all the infirmities both of body and mind played characters in our troubles 
Self-love disappointed has made great revolutionists. Marat and his friends. According to this precedency of ugliness, a series of gorgon heads mixed with the phantoms of the sixteen pass successively. The old physician of the Count d'Artois' bodyguard, the Swiss dwarf Marat, with sabots or shoes shod with iron on his feet without stockings, was the first to deliver his oration in virtue of his incontestable rights. Clothed with the office of fool at the court of the people, he shouted with his broad face and that simpering countenance of feudal politeness which the old system of training gave to every face. Two hundred and seventy thousand heads must fall. This Caligula of the highways was followed by Chemet, the atheist shoemaker. After the latter again came Camille Desmoulins, the attorney-general of the lamp-post. This stammering Cicero was the public counsellor of murderers, worn out with debauchery the light-headed republican full of puns and witticisms, the jester upon the mumbling ceremonies of the cemetery, who declared that in the massacres of September all things had been done decently and in order. He consented to become a Spartan, provided the making of the black broth should be left to Mayo, the restaurateur. Fouché, having run up from Juilly and Nantes, studied the calamities of the times under these masters. In the circle of these ferocious beasts, listening attentively at the base of the tribune, he exhibited the appearance of a hyena dressed like a man. He scented the future outpouring of blood. He already breathed the incense of processions of fools and executioners, awaiting the day on which, driven from the club of the Jacobins as a thief, an atheist, and an assassin, he should be selected as a minister of state. When Mara descended from the rostrum, this political tribulet became the sport of his masters. They bantered him, trod upon his toes, and hooted at him, which, however, did not prevent him from becoming the leader of the multitude, from mounting to the belfry of the Hôtel de Ville, sounding the tocsin of a general massacre, and triumphing at the revolutionary tribunal. Marat was overtaken by death. Chenier wrote his apotheosis. David painted him in his bloody bath, and he was compared to the divine author of the gospel. The following prayer was used in his honour. Heart of Jesus, heart of Marat, O sacred heart of Jesus, O sacred heart of Marat. This heart of Marat was placed in a precious pyx, in a rich repository. A cenotaph of gauze was erected on the Place du Carousel, where the public went to visit the bust, the bath, the lamp, and writing-desk of the divinity. The wind, however, changed. The filth poured from the agate urn into another vase, was emptied into the common sewer. End of chapter 1